So I love the book of Ruth. Um, when Rabbi Stoller first asked me about teaching and he gave me you know, some choices, I was like, oh, yeah, let's do the book of Ruth. I love the book of Ruth. We feel a little bit out of you know, the season. I mean, Kohelet is, was seasonally appropriate. We're skipping ahead. I don't really like winter that much, so let's skip ahead. <laughs> um, because traditionally, Ruth is read on Shavuot, right on the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot, so if you're, you know, if you uh, grew up with more of a, that Yiddish background, but that's when we usually read it. And um, and the question is, is why? Why do we read Ruth traditionally at that time of year? So I'm going to throw out questions. If people know the answer, you can just shout it out. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. Not everybody, you know, I don't know. I have no way of knowing what everybody knows, but. Um, so what, what does the holiday of Shavuot, what does it, uh, what do we commemorate on Shavuot? Receiving of the Torah. Receiving of the Torah, right? The receiving of the Torah, um, receiving of the Ten Commandments. So that's what Shavuot commemorates. It comes seven weeks after Pesach. Um, so what is it about the book of Ruth that was, that compelled um, the rabbis, I would say, to decide that this would be an appropriate reading for the holiday of Shavuot. So we could either answer those questions in advance, or we could keep it in our mind as we read through the book of Ruth. What is it? Why this book? Why was this book chosen to represent what we're thinking about at that time of year? So you know, we, let's just we'll just think about that. So Ruth, in some level, I mean, if you're you know. A good Hebrew reader and really understand Hebrew on some level is pretty written fairly simply compared to other other books of the Bible and uh, the book is actually the Hebrew is actually very similar in its in its Hebrew in its choice of Hebrew words um, it's very similar to other biblical narratives that we would uh, be probably hopefully very very um, familiar with uh, the general overview is it's not a book that talks a lot about God, though it does, unlike, you know, if you, you know, are familiar with the book of Esther, where we say that, you know, God is, you know, hidden in that book, that God is never overtly mentioned. Um, God is, is more commonly mentioned in Ruth, but God is not doing anything very dramatic in this book. Right? We're not seeing the splitting of the Red Sea. We're not seeing mana come down from heaven. We're not seeing anything really dramatic in the book of Ruth, except that, of course, human behavior, what happens within families, death, sickness, um, renewal. Um, some of us would probably argue that those are actually quite dramatic uh, events, but they're the events of, uh, that happen to people, right? I mean, there are lovely coincidences that you think, you know, this, you know, this was shared, um, that did happen in the book of Ruth, but you don't see any sort of, you know, God saying, well, if I put her here and I put him here and they should happen to meet, then good things will happen. Like, if you don't see that in the book of Ruth, it's not like, it's a story of what happens to simple people in the life of trying to live their lives, only they're not such a simple people, because there are ancestors. And they play a very important role in what happens in the life of, of the Jewish people. Um, and so, of course, it reminds us then that God acts in ordinary events. That, that God acts not just in the big drama that we see in other places in, in the Tanakh, but God acts um, in the lives of people simple like you and me, and you know, become the, uh, the ancestors of. David, even though you are just a simple Moabite woman. Um, there are common themes that come in the book of Ruth, which I will just write on the board. You don't have to take these notes. These are sort of just things to think about as we're kind of going through it. Should I spell it right? Complaint and celebration. So sort of how you go from um, something really bad to something really good, how you can go from emptiness to fullness, and a lot of coming and going. <laughs> one of my, uh, you know, one of my sermons, um, I don't keep a morning actually, 
felt like it's a theme. But when I, when I took a, I was involved in a, a program called um, the Hartman Institute when I was, uh, for the last several years. And so it was with the same group of rabbis studying together for three years we studied together. And one of the things that they asked us um, at the very beginning of the program was, what's your go-to sermon? rabbis function, but what's your go-to, what's your go-to sermon? So this, uh, you know, so I hope, I hope it's not so very obvious what, what mine is, but, but the, really the question was, is what, what inspires you? What, what, what are you really so interested in that you're compelled, you, you know, maybe you don't give a sermon about it every year, but it's a theme that you return to because it's something that moves you so much and so deeply, and that was really easy for me. You know, other rabbis would have very different answers, but my answer was really very easy. That's something that I come back to over and over and over again, um, is how is it that human nature has the ability to go from the depths of despair and start over again? I, I, there's a never ending, I mean, as a, as a congregational rabbi, it's something that I see, that all of us see all the time. I mean, I have millions of stories, right, of people that, um, the one that always sticks in my mind is going to visit a woman who had recently become, she'd, come away, she'd just become widow, and I was coming to help her prepare for her husband's funeral, and it was the dead of winter, and it was, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was already getting dark, and it was freezing, and the leaves were bare, um, and I walked into her house, which was, you know, so sad. Her husband hadn't been very old. She was probably, I'm thinking, maybe 60 when this happened, and so sad, right? So sad. Three years later, I was officiating at her second marriage. It happened to be she chose a day in June. It happened to be a beautiful sunny day with the leaves and the flowers, which just made it very poetic, but you know. And she said to me, life has, like I never thought, she said, I never thought this would happen. Like I never in my wildest imagination ever thought that I would meet somebody, but life has an unbelievable way of and I quote her all the time, right? because I thought, to me, that is sort of the, the beauty and the mystery of human existence. Um, and I gave another sermon about it on Yom Kippur this year, where I shared stories from the congregation um, of people that I just had, in the things, stories I had heard in the past year, one of them was a gentleman who at 95 was in Lieberman. He had already outlived two wives, and he met, he met somebody in when they were 95, and uh, they used to hold hands in their wheelchairs, and he uh, he really, they wanted to get married, they wanted to get married, um, Lieberman wasn't quite sure how that was going to, they really didn't have a experience with dealing with that, and the residents got very excited to be celebrating a wedding in Lieberman. In the end, unfortunately, they did not get married because her children felt that he might be taking advantage of her. So I, I personally said, if I'm 95 years old and you want to take advantage by marrying me, you know, I, that's okay. Sounds good to me. But, what an, but to me, it was such an amazing story. So that's really what I love about part of what I love so much about the Book of Ruth is it's exactly that kind of story. Right? It's exactly the kind of story where people are at a point in life where you think nothing could possibly, you know, what more could be worse than this? And then you see them begin after loss and death and suffering, you begin to see them, how they sort of rebuild their lives. Um, not always eloquently, not always easily, but that's what I find so inspiring about this story. So, let's, uh, we're gonna dig in. I'm ready to go, I'm good to go. So, um, what do we know about the beginning of the Book of Ruth. So we're going to obviously do this in English, but every once in a while I might refer to the Hebrew. I'm going to go under the assumption that not everybody is a Hebrew reader and not everybody understands Hebrew. So that's the basis of the class is that everything's going to be in English, but sometimes I might want to point things out to you in Hebrew um, because they're, you know, that's, that's sort of the magic of the text. The magic of the text is the Hebrew. So. What do we know about the beginning of the Book of Ruth? So the first thing that we know about the beginning of the Ruth, of Ruth and it's not, you know, I don't know why they translated it as chieftains. In the days when the chieftains ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
um, because it really the Hebrew is, is judges, and that's the period, right? The book, the, the time of the judges is the period. I don't think we, I don't know why they refer to judges. This translation is judges. Okay, so that's okay. So that's I personally think that's better, but that's you know, I, I would you know I, I would I always hate to criticize the person that translates. Um, into English because they are far more scholarly than I am, and I'm sure they had a very compelling reason. I just don't know what it is. Um, so, what do we know? Do we know anything um, about the period of, of the judges, which, in case you're wondering, is about 950 to 700 BCE? Um, what do we know from the Bible about the period of the judges? Does anybody know anything? Yes, very good, right, Deborah, right, yeah, yes, yes, so that's, yes, Samson, right, we pulled it right, so it was not the ideal period of Jewish history, right, it's, um, it's depicted in the Tanakh, uh, it's a very difficult time, you have judges that are good, you have judges that are bad, there's no central government, there's anarchy, um, it, it's, it's historically a very bad time, and it's what actually uh, compels the Israelites to want a king. Which, let's be honest, was not so great either. That didn't work out so well either. But um, the Torah seems to be pretty clear that it's skeptical of kings, um, and that, of course, God is king, and so the Israelite people shouldn't need. So the Israelite people shouldn't um, want a king or need a king, but after hundreds of years of the period of judges, which is so negative, they want a strong central leader. So that's the first thing that we know about about this time period. Is it's not a great it's not a great time period for the Israelite for the Israelite people. The other thing is the book starts with the word um, viahi. So people, there's certain people have said that they know, they know Hebrew. How would we? I mean, they translate in the days. The and it was. And it was. Okay. So if you, that's what your says. If your book says and it was. Okay, and it was. And it was. So if you translate it that way, which is I think is a more accurate translation, what is then the first word of the book? And. <laughs> and. And. And it was like your English teacher would say to you, you can't right. You're gonna start a sentence. You're gonna start a whole book with the word and. Like no, you can't do that. You can't do that. That would not be right. So and it was. So um, you know, uh, scholars say that it sets a certain tone. Um, and it was in those days should sound to us, um, you know, people that have read lots of things in English. Um, what, what, what phrase in English could it once, once, upon once upon a time, right? And it was is like once upon a time. Now we know, when you, well, I don't know, what do we know? From a literary point of view, if you start a book once upon a time, what assumptions you know, do you make as a reader? Might not be real, so it's got a fairy tale quality to it. Um, but do you Fairy tales, just because it's not real, what do fairy tales sometimes? There's a moral. There's a moral. Right, there's a moral component, right? Once upon a time, um, <clears throat> I think like, you know, Cinderella, the moral component is if you're beautiful, um, <laughs> and sweet and good, and never asked for anything, um, then okay. you'll get chosen by the prince. And maybe, who might that remind us of? <laughs> Doug Esther, right? You know, we have those things too. So I don't know that the morals of those stories are necessarily, you know, don't go off into the woods by yourself. Um, you know, but but the, but these are there are truths, right? There are truths beyond the history. So while this may be suggesting that this is, you know, that the story as it presents itself has what it claims to be history in it, right? This we're going to learn about. Um, I don't want to ruin the end of the story, but who is uh, Ruth the ancestress of? Anybody know? David. David. King David, right? So this is a story about our ancestors who are shrouded in history, so it is claiming to be something that really happened. But at the same time, the author is choosing to be 
begin it in a way that, and in those days, you know, in the olden days. So it does start out with this, this sense that there's this sort of fable um, telling of the story. And what else do we learn right away in the first verse? We're not even in the first verse, the first half of the verse. In the days when the chieftains ruled or when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So this is like, you know, I mean, there's a little one. I'll ask you, what do you say? When you hear that there's a famine in the land, let's talk about what that, you know, what that makes us feel, think. Well, Abraham had to go into Egypt the first time with Sarah. That's right. So let's start from the very beginning, right? This is going to be a story that's going to have similarities to the stories of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, right? It's going to have that sort of quality to it. So Abraham has to leave the land because there is the famine. Who else suffers from famine in those stories? Right. Jacob and his sons, right? They, Isaac, there's a famine. Jacob and his sons, Joseph. The whole beginning of the Torah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, it, right, it could be a punishment by God. I mean, they're, they're sort of like, what's happening? You know, um, all right, let's say that it is. I, I can go with that. Let's go from a biblical perspective. Um, it's already starting out, that it's the time of the judges. It's a lawless time. It's not good. And now it's really not good. But it resonates with us. Oh, we know this story. We've heard other founders of the Jewish people had to suffer from this. I mean, one of the interesting things, many, many, many interesting things about the Abraham story, his great faithfulness, I and mean, we talk a lot about his great faithfulness in the binding of Isaac, but you know, God says to him, leave your land, go to the land that I will show you. He shows up in the land and there's a famine. Like, thanks. <laughs> like, thanks a lot. Like, and there's war, and you know, like he said, I give the land to you, and I'd like to say, you know, God told Abraham, he just forgot to tell the people live there, um, which we're still dealing with thousands of years later, it's still, you know, the same issue. So, um, you know, and you'd think that Abraham might respond by saying, you know, all the, you could have chosen something, you know, I, uh, you know, and Israel still, you know, so the, that theme of famine runs through Genesis, right, runs through the entire book of Genesis. Um, and much of the narrative is, is about how the different people deal with the fact that there's a famine, right? And how the children of Israel get into Egypt, uh, you know, by the book of Exodus, is all about the response of how they dealt with the famine, how Joseph dealt with the famine. So this is a very common theme, and it sets the tone, you know, complaint, emptiness, like things are really bad. You know, things are really bad. And what do people do when there's a famine in the land of Israel? What do they have to do? They have to leave, right? They have to leave and go someplace where there's food. Um, so, and we're only in the you know first half of the first sentence. Um, and but I have you know we have an hour and a half, so that's you know that's good. Um, so, a man of Bethlehem in Judah, with his wife and two sons, went to reside in. So it, Bethlehem in Hebrew is what? Beit Lechem. Right, Beit Lechem. And what's Lechem? Bread. 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 Beit is by each or house, right? So the name is loaded, you know, it's just like this irony. Right? The, the place where they live, the name of the place that they live is House of Bread. And there's no bread in the House of Bread. There's no bread in the House of Bread. So you can already see, you know, um, charming might not be the right word. For it, but you already see sort of the nature of, you know, kind of the use of language, right? The use of language in one sentence packs a lot of information already. It resonates with the history of the Torah. In Hebrew, the biblical Hebrew of the Book of Ruth is very similar to the Hebrew of Genesis, which makes um, scholars think that Ruth is very old, right? that the Book of Ruth is very old because it's got the same. Um, level of development of Hebrew of. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not good. Same I'm sorry, what? Same root. Uh, there's no shin, though. There's no shin. Um, 
So this man of Bethlehem has to leave to go to find um, food. And he leaves with his wife and his two sons. Um, at the moment, we don't know his name, right? He's just an anonymous person, probably one of many anonymous people that laugh to go find food. Yeah, I, I think about this on occasion. I mean, I certainly think about it at Sukkot time, which we just came through in the harvest and all of that. Um, one of the other things, I feel, I feel like I quote my sermons a lot, you know, <laughs> in the weeks. Like in August, I start to find myself speaking in these grandiose terms. You know, people say, how are you? How am I? <laughs> when we think about how I am, we must ask, and I'm like, I'm sure I'm driving my family crazy. <laughs> okay, we just have to go to the grocery store. Is there food in the... So, and then, and then I find, like, you know, I quote them a lot, because it's like, well, I didn't work really hard on them, and in a few weeks it's all over, so I might as well, you know, I might as well quote them to new people who didn't hear them while they're still fresh in my mind, because I was, you know, ultimately quite, quite proud of them. But one of the things that I also talked about, um, you know, especially on Yom Kippur, right, we're fasting, and we're hungry, and, um, you know, maybe we have a headache, or maybe we're crabby, and I'm going to speak in generalizations, but I'm going to make assumptions about all of you. Not one of us is going to a break fast that wouldn't probably feed a village in Africa. Right? <laughs> right? Like it's, and, like, we are, so, Leon Wieseltier, who's a, a writer and publisher, called, um, and pirates don't like this, even though I quote it, because I actually really do like it, um, he called us, American Jews, the spoiled brats of Jewish history. Or the spoiled brats. So I think like, that's so negative. I'm like, okay, you know, it is negative. I understand that. But I think that thinking about the fact that by and large, none of us know what real hunger is. None of us go to bed hungry. None of us have ever had to leave our homes in search of food. Um, and even though we're concerned about anti-Semitism in the world today, um, none of us are under direct, you know, violent threat of anti-Semitism, that we're really probably one of the few and maybe the first generations of Jewish history that have such different challenges than to that. Thank you. I was getting a little thirsty in spite of talking about, you know, really thirsty. <laughs> Um, but this was the reality of our, of our ancestors, right? The reality of our ancestors was hunger and having to leave your home to find food. And you just have to really open the newspaper, you know, and people in Africa are doing this every day, right? They're leaving war-torn villages, um, risk their lives to go however many miles to get water that's actually drinkable. My kids do this, I'm sure your kids done it, I've probably done it myself. You open the refrigerator and say, there's nothing to eat. Um, or the corollary in my closet, there's nothing to wear. Um, but what that means is there's nothing exciting to eat. There's nothing exciting. It's like, well, have an egg, you know, have some salad. Like, there's something to eat, it's just not entertaining. Um, but this is the reality, of course, of our ancestors, right? That they leave their homes search of food, and they go to places that aren't safe. Because Moab is not really a particularly safe place because you're not a citizen. And Egypt, we know, is certainly not a safe place. When Abram has to leave to go to Egypt, when, well, Joseph, uh, when even when, well, part of what's dangerous about Egypt for the brothers is Joseph. Um, but of course, what happens to the Israelites in Egypt when they, you know, after time is they become enslaved. So, you know, in, in the Torah, it talks a lot about what it means to be a resident alien, which is not safe. And the Torah talks a lot about how you treat resident aliens that are not citizens that live in Israel. That you have certain responsibilities not to mistreat them, because not being a citizen is very, can be very dangerous. But, I mean, you have no rights. I mean, in ancient times, even if you were a citizen, you might not have very many rights in your own country. But if you were a foreigner, you were a stranger, then you were in a very precarious position, relying on just the goodwill of the people that were there. So we know right away, in, again, in the first verse, 
that leaving to go to Moab is bad, but what do we know about Moab from the Torah? Right? right. Are we from right. Lot's on from a right. Are we good relationship? relationship? Right. Are we good? We, 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 get a, we, we get some of those in. It's always great we have these strange relationships, and of course it's, you know, 13-year-old kids, Parsha. It's like, oh, well, yes, okay, let's talk, we'll find something that you can talk about. Um, <laughs> don't, don't talk about Lot and his daughters, but we'll find something else in the Parsha. Anyways, what else do we know about Moab? Are they good friends with Israel? No, they're not good friends about they're, they're enemies, actually, of ours. When the Israelites are traveling um, on the way back from Egypt to the land of Israel, um, the Moabites are one of our enemies. So you're going to, now maybe at this moment in history, relations were a little better, but basically you're leaving to go to enemy, or enemy ter ter territory. The other thing that's interesting is we, uh, in the Torah, the Israelites are told that they cannot marry anybody from Gonna, you know, and yet this is all a, a story about uh, an exception to that rule. And so we can also sort of ask ourselves the question of what is, you know, what does that mean? Um, that, that, that a book of the of the Bible is codified with an exception to the law to a law of Torah. Okay, we ready for verse two? <laughs> <laughs> um, tell, where is Moab? Where is? Uh, it's Jordan. Ah. Right, it's Jordan today. Okay, um, so, um, just looking to see if I have anything else in my notes that we might not want to miss before we go on to, um, oh, this is interesting, I think. Vayelech ish, right, and a, and a man went, that phrase, um, to sojourn is actually, that exact phrase is also found in Moses. So it resonates, again, with the idea of the birth of someone who is going to do something really great and important and special for the Jewish people. Okay, so verse two. The man's name was Eli Meleth. So um, that's actually a Hebrew, real Hebrew name, right? That's a, that's a real Hebrew name. And it means what, anybody know? My right, my God is king, or God is my king. It's always a little tricky with these names because it could go either way. But okay, so either God is my king or my God is king. Um, again, interesting, just because we were talking about the judges. Um, so who's king? God, right? That's the way. Uh, that's right in the world. What might this name? Because we know that names are. You know, what does might this name say about this person if he actually had the qualities? that his parents hoped to instill in him by naming him Eli Malas? Observant. Observant. Observant, right, loyal, faithful, especially as he's leaving the land of Israel. Um, you know, faithful to God even in the time of deep, you know, uh, despair. His wife's name is Naomi. Pleasant, lovely, right, pleasant. It's a, nice, it's a very nice name. And then the sons are Mahlon and Chilion, which basically translates, they don't translate it here as sickness and death. <laughs> <laughs> so, chances are this is not their birth names. <laughs> Unless Naomi and Ali Melech had a very odd uh, way of choosing their children's names. Um, so this sort of comes back to the fable or mythic quality of the story, right? Their names represent not the aspirations um, of the Jewish people and the aspirations of um, what we hope is going to happen in the story, but it, it uh, illustrates sort of the dark underpinnings of what is about to happen in the story. You know, this is this is um, how they're remembered for all of history um, with these horrific, we do not use these names. We'll never hurt anybody, um, yes. you know, called this. And they also sort of rhyme, right? Mahlon and Chilion in Hebrew sort of, they rhyme. Um, we know nothing about them, right? They're here and they're gone. We know nothing about them and that, other than the fact that, you know, they really do represent 
sickness and, um, and death. So, there are Fratites of Bethlehem in Judah, and they come to the country of Moab, and they remain there. Right? So this is their, this is not a quick trip. Right? This isn't just a trip to pick up supplies and then go back. They are semi-permanent. This isn't just going to Florida for the winter. <laughs> this is semi-permanent residency um, in, in the country of Moab. And by verse 3, now things are going to get really bad. Right? Things are going to get, you know, if they were bad enough that there was famine, which is a bad you know, national tragedy, but also obviously a family tragedy as well, things are going to get worse. <laughs> so Ellie Melech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So it's sort of like, you know, we're going to graph it. You know, it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse by, like, levels. So bad, you don't have any food. Next bad, your husband dies. Now, of course we know that that's an emotionally devastating thing. But, and I'm supposed to say in ancient times, but the reality is it's not just in ancient times. Um, a widow in society was extremely vulnerable. She was vulnerable economically. You know, she was, um, well, she was vulnerable economically because uh, the husband was the breadwinner, which is nice for Bay Lefton. Yeah. <laughs> it's good, that, that works out nicely. But the, the husband is the provider, the protector. She can't just go out and say, well, I'll, you know, I'm going to go back to work and I'll get, I mean, she probably could, but her choices would be so very limited as to what a woman in that society would have been able to do um, to make any kind of a living. And she's a resident alien. You know, in the Torah, we always talk about not mistreating, and it's usually three people um, that go together. Anybody know who we're not supposed to mis the you know the, the triple uh, threat of who we're not supposed to mistreat? The widow, the orphan, the, widow, the orphan and the stranger. <laughs> She's a widow. Her children are orphans, and they're all strangers. So we know from the Torah, this is the most vulnerable group of people you could possibly have. And that's why the Torah tells us that when it's our turn and people are living in the land of Israel, we better be careful about how we treat them. And then, of course, the whole thing about the exodus from Egypt and we were strangers in a strange land and therefore we should know not to do what was done to us and never to mistreat the stranger. But Moab, one can assume, does not have that kind of um, moral law. I mean, have other moral laws, but I'm not a scholar of ancient Moabite society, but the assumption is, is that's what set Israel um, and the Torah apart from other ancient societies were these um, moral convictions. So they are the triple, the triple threat here. And they married Moabite. <coughs> this is not, I don't want to make a commentary on intermarriage today. Right? This is not, but what does, in ancient times, what does this, if you just read that phrase, they married Moabite women, what, what resonates for you in ancient times from hearing this? They're out of the clan, right? They're out of the clan. They're out by choice, they rejected it. They were, they're, you know, they're kind of becoming Moabites, right? They're kind of becoming Moabites, because it's one thing, as we'll see, to bring a Moabite woman into your clan, right? Um, in the, you know, so Abraham is already married to Sarah when we meet him. But what happens with Isaac? Arranged marriage. marriage with Rebecca. And what does she need to do? She needs to come into the tent of his mother. Right, into the tent of his mother. Uh, exactly right. So she comes, has to come to him. Right? Rachel and Leah, again, back into the you know family. But eventually, they have to come into Israel. So there are women that are brought in that aren't born of Israelite parents, but they have to be brought into Israel and the, and the clan. This is the opposite, right? They are marrying Moabite women. They are making this temporary journey to Moab pretty permanent, right? They're settling down. They're marrying women, local women. Um, if things don't change very drastically, as we'll see in a moment, they'd probably just stay in Moab, and that would have been the end of, 
it was at the end of the story. Uh, and remember, we have a law that says you're not supposed to marry anybody from Moab. So they're also violating a law of the Torah that says that you're not supposed to do this. So one is named Orpah. I read somewhere at one point that Oprah, right, that somebody right. got it, you know, yeah. transposed. Um, though, frankly, I'm not really 100% sure why you would choose Orpah as a, you know, if you know anything about the story, she really didn't do anything to merit, you know, getting named after, but okay. She's supposed to be the great-grandmother of Goliath. Oh, really? Oh, Goliath. that's a midrash that she was the great-grandmother of Goliath. Oh, that's nice and poetic, then. So then Goliath and David meet up. Okay. Right, right. But I feel like we need to let her off the hook. Like, we need to let her off the hook. She might not be a great, shining example of a heroine of the Jewish people, but you could ask yourself, if you were in her position, what would you, know, what would you have done? So Orpah and the other Ruth, and they lived there 10 years. Um, so that's a long time, right? That's a long time to be married and not have what? Children. Children, right? So they marry Moabite women. Have no children, 10 years, that's in biblical times, you know, in well, in the modern times, if you want to have a child and you can't have a child for 10 years, you pretty much have given up hope at that point that you're ever going to have a biological child. So that's a huge <laughs> issue um, that doesn't get uh, flushed out in the text. So it sounds like God was not happy that they intermarried, uh, the husband's dying, they were buried. Yeah, God, you know, the story never says that God's wrath is going to come upon these people. But the question is, if you believe in a world where God is controlling, you know, what happens, and you've got famine and sickness and death and infertility, you got to wonder, right? Like, are they doing something wrong? The other thing about infertility that's very interesting in the Torah, because we read a lot about infertility in the Torah. Who's infertile? Again, once we keep going back to these Genesis stories, you just, you know, all of these themes are there. So who's infertile in Genesis? Like everybody, right? Who's infertile? Sarah. Sarah's infertile. Rebecca's infertile. Rachel is infertile. Leah, God bless her, you know. <laughs> Saves the Jewish people and has all those children. Um, Hannah, who we just read about on, um, on, uh, Yom, on Rosh Hashanah, is infertile. And what happens in all of those cases? What ends their infertility? God. Right? They pray to God, and God steps in. In Sarah's case, we're told specifically, explicitly by the text, that she no longer menstruates. In case you had any question, Rebecca, we don't hear that about Rebecca or Hannah or Rachel. Um, but with Sarah, lest you have any doubt that it's a miracle, um, the text is very explicit in telling you that this is, would be biologically impossible, so it can only be an act of God, and it says, in, in her case, that God remembers. That God remembers. So infertility, um, whether it is a punishment or not a punishment, um, what uh, ends infertility in all of these cases is a miracle. So that's also something to sort of just keep. We're not going to get to that until, you know, week three. Um, but that's sort of also something to keep in mind when we're reading the story about, the, I don't think it really is focused on as much, that Ruth and Orpah were both infertile for 10 years. So nothing, so nobody's producing anything, right? Nobody, they can't produce bread and they can't produce children and this is all a very temporary and dangerous situation. And then those two, and again, when you read a word about then those two, Machal and Chilion, what does that sound like to you? Very insignificant people. Right, They're those, then those two. Oh, their names, right? You could have said, well, what could you have said if you were writing the story? What, how could you have written the sentence? Any English teachers in here? How could you have written the sentence differently? That would be the obvious way to start the story. Mm -hmm. Then Machal and Chilion died. You know, that would be the easiest, simplest, most eloquent way to write sentence. So what is the narrator trying to tell us when they write, and then those two, 
trying to say it in a way that, you know, it's neutral. And then those two, Mahlon and Chilion, died. Sneering. It sounds a little sneering. It's sort of a little snarky, a little, you know, um, you know, you two over there, right? If you don't call somebody by, I mean, they get to the names, right? But if you don't call somebody by their names, or you hesitate before you call them by their names, um, it's showing sort of disdain for the people that you're talking about. Also, they're unimportant. And they're unimportant. They're, they're not even important. They're not, what do they really do? <laughs> like, I give you the background, let's move out of the story. That's right, they have nothing to do with the story. They die, they're childless. They marry Moabite women. They live there for 10 years. They clearly have no plans to return to Israel, which this was supposed to be a temporary situation. So they're, they're not even barely worthy of mentioning their names. We have to tell you that they died because that's an important part of the story. But other than that, we're done. We're done with sickness and death. Like, we're done with them. Um, and their names are so not nice. Really, why, you know, why would you even want to mention those names? Because they're not really particularly very nice names. So, so the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. So this is like, you know, again, yeah, this is the, the low of the law, right? This woman, I mean, you become a widow, you lose your only two children, your two sons. Like, in, in human existence, there's probably not much you can work rank over that. And you have two Moabite daughter-in-laws. And you have two Moabite daughter-in-laws, right? <laughs> so you got two Moabite daughter-in-laws. You're in a foreign country. Now you're a widow and you have no male protectors at all because your two adult male children who could have provided for you and protected you are gone. You have, I mean, you couldn't have less than she has at that moment. And what else doesn't she have in the verse? She has no grandchildren. Yes, I wasn't thinking about that, but she has no grandchildren. But read the verse again. What did they call her? The woman. The woman. So she doesn't even she doesn't even have any name. She does it's almost I don't I don't want to stretch the text here, but if you're a mother and you've lost your children, like what are you? What are you? I mean, you're still a mother, right? I mean, but really, what are you? When you you're not a wife anymore. You're not a mother anymore. You have, what, what do you have left? And I don't just mean like you're not a, a dog owner who lost your pet, which is traumatic enough. And then you can't say to people, I'm a pet owner, when you no longer own a pet. But the very foundation of, of human existence, our identity is our family relations, who we're married to, who our children are. Um, what greater loss could there be than losing your only two children and having nothing and no grandchildren and nothing? I mean, you know, you just have to, your heart breaks for this poor woman. And, and the truth is, is Naomi bounces back kind of. Right? She bounces back kind of, but not totally. And we're going to see that throughout the text. Um, that she's got a great deal of strength and a lot to admire, but I, I see her and some of the things that she says that we'll look at together, as you can imagine quite closely, um, that she, she, who would recuperate? What, what would recuperation from something like this even look like? You have a woman and you have those two, and yet patriarch is Ellie Bella. What, what higher name can you restore right. about someone? Right. And then those two right, that's right. And yet he's dead. You know, like this great hopes for whoever Ali Malik would be. He dies and then the story just goes down without him. So she's lost her identity. I think so. I mean she's lost her identity, you could imagine. You know, one of the things that I think about a lot and why I actually love um, uh, I dare I say even prefer, I can say don't tell my congregation, I just said this to you. Um, <laughs> teaching adults. Even though I do a lot of teaching of children, and I love children, and, you know, I, you know, love Jewish education, but I feel like we um, have to tell these stories at the level that, uh, for children. And you're not going to really say to children, and then everybody died, and she was all alone, and her <laughs> husband died. And children, like we we tell these stories that are so um, deep and painful and dramatic, and we all, you know, Ruth, it was the 
barley harvest, and you know, it, um, and she was the grandmother of King David. But you can't really. Oh, and then yeah, Pharaoh threw the babies into the Nile, and, and then we celebrate. You know, and we had some plagues, and then we got out of Egypt. Um, these stories are so are, are um, so many of them so tragic and so profoundly sad. And again, like as I said at the beginning, these are not the stories of the splitting of the Red Sea. These are the stories of human existence, and human existence is so can be so sad. Yes. And we, we know people like this. So I've got a question. Yes. The loss of the enemy or perceived loss of the enemy. She was married to only one. So there must be something in her that can relate to that. So I'm not sure it's a totally, totally hopeless thing. So it would be different as if she was married to the death of the second son. <laughs> you know, then, then I don't know if there's that come back. I mean, I think Naomi really, we're, we're going to see, like, I, I'm not, like, I'm a Naomi fan, I think she rises to the occasion, but there are hints throughout the story that she suffered. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, lose your, your kids and your husband and see if you, you know, rebound as a, you know, the same person that you were before this happened. I mean, obviously people carry these traumas and traditions, and we know people like this. And even if we don't know people with that drama, right, that nobody gets through life without loss. I mean, I wish, I really wish that we could. Like, I really wish it was a different system. If I had been asked or consulted, I might have had some other suggestions. <laughs> um, and, and, as, you know, and as the Jewish people, like we may be the spoiled brats of Jewish history, but we're a blip on the, you know, we're a blip in the history of Jewish history if we want to talk about um, tragedy um, and how people overcome or how a people um, go on after you know experiencing you know thousands of years. I, I thought I thought about this a lot, frankly, in the aftermath of 9-11. I felt like a lot of Americans who were not Jewish were going around asking, you know, how could anybody do this to us? Like we're we're Americans and we're good people and we care about you know the world and we have these like values and these people, they don't appreciate it. They don't appreciate human life. They don't appreciate our values. And how could they do this to us? Now, I know this is generalizing. I didn't feel like Jewish people were asking that question. Jewish people were horrified and mourning. And, but I don't, think, I don't think Jewish people have the sort of naivete of asking how could anybody, how could evil people uh, make innocent people suffer? Because we were sort of felt like, well, I, you know, I, how could God let this happen? Right, like in a way, we, we asked, I mean, it's not that we didn't uh, suffer profound mourning and loss as, as Americans, as, as everybody else did, but I think that the questions that we brought to it, I think there were subtle differences because I don't think we would have the naivete to say, um, how could God let this terrible thing happen to these <coughs> people? Because we're still, we don't, we don't know the, we don't know the, we don't, we don't know the answer. But we don't. But we. But we know that the question is like you know. Well, we've got a long list of it. We we we'd like to ask those questions when we meet God and say, you know, while I'm up here, I'd like to. I have a. I have a list. Um, it didn't start on 9/11. It started, you know, thousands of years ago. But we have some questions. So nobody gets through without suffering, and I guess that's why I keep coming back to this theme that's so um, compelling to me. And I think we see it. And we're going to see it in Naomi and Ruth is what is it, I mean, I, you know, we know, so we know these people, and then we ask them, and some people really never function again after a loss. I mean, we know that, let's be honest. You know, we know that some people really, if the loss is profound enough, can never ever lead a normal life again. But there are many people that we probably look at and we go, how do they even get out of bed in the morning? How do they even get out of the bed, get dressed, uh, and eventually at some point put a smile on their face and function? And I'm so, in, I mean, for me, I'm so in awe of those people. Another story from a sermon, um, but we had a woman in our congregation who um, lost an adult daughter to cancer. 
And when she was um, almost 80, which her, her daughter died, I think she was probably in her late 70s, and when she was 80, she decided that she was going to have an adult bat mitzvah in her daughter's memory. So any of you that have ever tried to master a language that you didn't know very well, at 80, you know that this is quite, was quite some effort. And she celebrated her bat mitzvah on our bima, and her other daughter, her, her surviving daughter, is a cantor, is a reformed cantor in Cleveland. And she had asked me in advance, can I bless my mother on the bima? And I said, absolutely. The, the, the mother passed away this year, so that's why these were all sermon snippets from um, people that had passed away in the past year, inspirational stories. So she's standing on the bima, and her daughter puts her hands on her mother's head. Our beam isn't really flooded in sunlight, but my memory of it is that the rays of the sun were shining in on mother and daughter, and there was like this sunny, you know, halo around them. And then the daughter put her hands on her mother's head, and I hear the mother say quietly to her daughter, is there anyone as blessed as I? And that blew me away. Is there, any, is there anyone as blessed as I? Now, this is not to say that she never cried over the loss of her daughter again, and that she never suffered anymore, and from then on, the pain of her daughter's death went away. But what I was so blown away with is that how could anyone ever feel blessed again? Ever! And that was a spontaneous, like I don't think she planned, like I'm gonna say this, she, at that moment, she truly felt blessed. And those are the stories that I come back to over and over again, this amazing thing that you could have a tragedy happen, and still, at maybe not every day, and not every moment of every day, but still have moments where your life feels beautiful and meaningful and worth living. And I don't really, frankly, understand it, because you think that most people, it has something that happened to your, or you said a friend or a relative, that you would want to just pull the cover up over your head and never, like, live again. Another part of the sermon was, some people, they have to go through not only a mourning, but they have to go through a period where they deal with the guilt for wanting to live again. How could I possibly be happy if this thing happened to my loved one? There's a beautiful prayer in, in the conservative Sidor at Yisker that I love that talks about remembering your loved one. And it says, may I always feel the right to joy. And that's an amazing thing because people who've suffered horrific losses very often feel like I don't deserve, how could I possibly be joyous when this thing happened to my loved one? So not only going through a period of mourning, but at some point feeling that you can reclaim um, part of the joy of living. So that's, you know, that's the sermon that I come back to again and again. And I guess we're gonna see, I think, how this plays out for Ruth and Naomi um, as we continue on. Well, I, my intention is Well, this thing takes much longer than I think anybody thinks. Americans tend to have this idea that after about four weeks, you should have closure and move on. <laughs> so Americans have a very warped idea of what a mourning period should be because we're a very happy, happy, joy, uh, you know, uh, type of a culture. Um, I could say here of my baby. Mother came, my friends came, my aunts came. I couldn't get up. Couldn't get up. But somehow you're here today, so somehow over the course of you found the strength yes, to carry it. I found You found another one from him? <laughs> How long were you married to him? 27 years. <laughs> well, in Lieberman, you may meet somebody. <laughs> with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab 
For in the country of Moab, she had heard, we've all been waiting for this character to appear. I know it's only verse 6, but, you know, still, it's a lot of verses. She had heard that the Lord had taken note of his people and given them food. Right? So news arrives that there is now Lechem and Bay Lechem. And why? Because? God. So whoever said, is it, you know, the possibility of a famine being God's punishment? Uh, the text doesn't say that explicitly, but it certainly says that the fact that there's food now is God's doing. Now, the word in Hebrew, God has taken note. Uh, Hebrew is paka. This is the same word that's used when God remembers Sarah. Right, the God, paka, the word paka. Um, to remember, to take note, to pay attention to. Um, it's this, it's, I don't think it's the same root in the Exodus story, but we do know, right, that when God, is it, is it with Moses? With Moses, is it also Pekat? Thank you. So when God, you know, hears the crying of the children of Israel, so the word is Pekat, that's fantastic. So the word is Pekat. Um, so we know a lot of things, right? We know that, well, first of all, this is the first hint Everything is so bad. This is the first hint that we get in the text that things are going to start to improve. Because we promised that we were going to move from complaint to celebration and from emptiness to fullness. Um, we had a going or a coming to Moab. Now we're going to have a going back to the land of Israel. So this is the moment um, where the story, and again, if we were reading this, not in my pace, but at your pace, it would have seemed much faster. Um, but that's part of the good reason, that's part of the reason to slow it down because you understand that these six verses are just packed, that we're not really actually meant to read them so, so very fast. Um, and that God has done this unbelievable miracle and provided food. So, um, and also look how the text sort of slows down. It doesn't just say she left, right? She started, she started out with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab. For the, in the country of Moab, she had heard that the Lord had taken note of his people and given them food. Accompanied by her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living, and they set out on the road back to the land of Judah. So they mentioned Moab multiple times, which, in, you know, to emphasize where she's really, really, really leaving. But look how many times it says, she left, she set out, she left, she left, she set out. Like, again, you could have just said she left Moab with her two daughter-in-laws to set out to Judah, and we'd have even a shorter story to have to read. So it goes very, very slowly, um, you know, on purpose to make this big, this, this is a very dramatic turning point in the story. She's leaving Moab. They want to make, the narrator wants to make a very huge deal about this country where she's lived for over 10 years, that her son settled in, seemingly like they would never leave, it's now finally um, time to leave. The other thing that happens in verse 6 is all of the verbs that have been describing the action of what people have been doing, have been, you know, Hebrew is gendered. All of the verbs have been masculine. Right? He left, he went, he set out, he got married, he... And now you've got a story where it's going to talk about she. Now, of course, there are no men left, so what else would you do, really? Um, you don't have a lot of choices when you're only talking about women. Um, however, it does shift this idea that this is now a story where the action is going to be, um, for most of the rest of the story, the action is going to be led by women. And in the Bible, that's not a small thing. It's not a small thing because we don't have that many stories where the action is, you know, we get Esther for part of her story. Um, you know, we get certain stories about the matriarchs, but we don't have a lot of stories that where all of the action that moves forward is at the hands of women. Um, so, you know, something to make something to make note of. So, they're on their way. You know, so we assume that she's, I don't know if we know she's at the front door of her house or a block away or down the street. But the story suggests, obviously, that she's, you know, that she's moved. Um, also, let's 
funny. Well, you probably know this. I'm new at this. But when I stand up, I can read the text, and when I sit down, I can't. So, um, so what she's going to be doing. I've always wanted to do this too. Um, <laughs> so it feels very, you know, professorial to, yeah, you know, right. to be able to do that with your glasses. Um, I actually like to stand and teach, and now I've discovered that I can actually read better when I stand and teach. So what a what a nice thing. So what's she going to do? Anybody want to look in verse 7, um, which of course, so the word in Hebrew for return is? Shoot. shoot. Right, shoot. So, okay, so yes, there are probably other, you know, that you'd have to say let's shoot because that's how you say return. But shuv also has other connotations in Hebrew, having come just through the high holidays, what we were supposed to be doing for all of that time. We're supposed to be doing shuva, which, so shuv is to return, but it also becomes the word for repentance. And, you know, Naomi's family may have, you know, a little repenting to do for leaving the land of Israel, for staying away so long, for becoming, you know, for acculturating into Moab, uh, Moab, you know, Moab, that society. Um, so not only is she doing a physical return, of course she's doing a physical return, but she's also doing a spiritual return at this moment. So, Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, turn back, each of you, and the, you know, uh, also the word to turn back is shuv, right? So she's going to shuv, it's not really proper Hebrew, um, to go back to Judah, but she's telling her daughter-in-laws that the, that the shuving that they should be doing is to go back to their mother's house. Now, why their mother's house and not their father's house? Good question, because we would think that single women would be going back to the house of their father. So the only possibility that to make sense of this is that um, when Rebecca is described as becoming betrothed to, um, to Isaac, she's in her mother's house. Also, actually, in the Song of Songs, the female beloved is in her mother's house. So. We'll come back to this in a moment. Song of Songs, anybody know traditionally when, and I should tell you traditionally we don't read the Book of Ruth and Shavuot, we don't read it and we don't read the Song of Songs. So I'm saying traditionally, um, we don't read them as part of our services, but anybody know traditionally when you read Song of Songs? Yeah. Pesach, right? It's the great love poetry of the Bible. So, and Ruth on Shavuot. So one of the answers to the questions of why, you know, why Ruth on Shavuot is um, Song of Songs is the uh, love poet beloved and his beloved, beloved. Um, and Ruth is sort of the consummation because Pesach is we are setting out together in the desert and Shavuot is um, the ketubah, the marriage contract, right? the, the covenantal, the marriage um, part of it. So Song of Songs is still the, the honey, the dating period and Ruth is, you know, um, part of the Jewish people, the, the, the covenantal moment of, of the marriage. So both in Song of Songs and in Genesis, when they talk about the house of the mother, it's where betrothals take place. Or at least those are two examples that we have of that, and we have no examples of being betrothals taking place in the house of the father, which probably weren't literally homes, but probably maybe tents, right? So it actually makes sense to us that the mother may have had her tent and the father had his tent, or Many wives had their tents, and the father had his tent. People, you know, moved back and forth as, as needed. Um, but when the betrothal took place, that somehow that was went through, you know, the, the tent of the, the those the, those female things went through the tent of the mother. So it's possible if that's what it means that what what is Naomi saying then when she's sending Ruth and Orpah back to her mother's their mother's tents? It's time to find yoga. Go back. To Find another husband. Go find another husband, and, and that's where the likely place that you would do it would be. You'll go back, and your mother will help, you know, make this arrangement um, for you to have another husband. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead in me. Right. So this is high praise. Right? This is high praise about the type of daughter-in-laws that they've been. Right. They were good wives to Naomi's sons. And the fact that they've even come this far with Naomi and are even attempting to leave with her, um, that these are, you know, they're, they're, they're good girls, they're good daughter-in-laws. Um, 
I adored my mother-in-law. I adored my mother-in-law. I'm um, soon actually to become a mother-in-law myself. My older son just got engaged. So I decided that I have a master um, role model to, to live up with. My, my mother-in-law passed away several years ago, but that she's sort of my, my role model of the type of mother-in-law I want to be, which is mostly one who just you know keeps her mouth shut and <laughs> you know keeps her head down and um, is just loving and never critical and understands that my son's primary um, loyalty lies uh, with her and that I'm going to be mature about that. Um, at least publicly. At least publicly. So this is my, these are my goals. I'll come back next year and let you know how it's going to go. Um, but these are my goals. Um, but these girls are the quintessentially amazing daughter-in-laws, right? And Naomi recognizes that. Like in her moment of grief and loss and everything that she's lost, she recognizes that these, because you know, sometimes when people are suffering and grief, they blame the people that are around that don't deserve the blame. Or they take out their anger and frustration on people that are close to them that don't deserve it. That's human nature, it happens all the time. And in this moment for Naomi, she is recognizing her daughter in laws Yeah, it doesn't say why they would have started out with her and then she wants to send them back. I, I think the assumption from the text is that they're, gonna, they're prepared to go with her. Right? They're prepared to go. They set out with her and they're going to... It says that they, they did set out, didn't they? Um, they set out on the road back to Judah. Yes. Yeah, so they set out, right? So she, they're traveling with her. So the assumption is they're going with her and she says, she stops them and says, you know, you're wonderful, you're loyal, you're loyal to my sons, well, to me, but you need to have a life, right? You need to go back. And it's actually, you know, would make a lot of sense. Where are Moabite widows most likely to find husbands? In Moab, right? You know, we may be aware, probably is aware that um, you're not, that in Israel, you're not supposed to marry a Moabite woman. So she's going to bring these women back to Israel? Like, nobody's going to marry them there. They're foreigners. They're Moabite foreigners. What kind of life would they possibly have in Israel? But she could send them home, and then hopefully they'll have a chance at a second, at a second life. So it's incredibly um, loving and kind of her in that moment. Amen. Yes? I guess my question is, so how come she even let them start out with her? You know, why would, is that what you were asking to hear? You know, that... Just before she, you know, she's getting ready to leave, that you could go back with your mother and I'll leave instead of letting them come with. Well, I don't know. What do you think? They just went. They just went, right? With without being asked or without being told? Maybe she was agitating and thinking about it. She wasn't quite sure, but as she was going, the thought was, you know what? Why don't I let them leave and have a life? So maybe over time, is, is there, you know, because the text, the way the text slows it down, it's, and I, I think you kind of get the assumption that she's walking. I mean, you know, maybe she's got a camel, but they're not traveling very quickly, right? I mean, how, how, how quickly could you travel? So as they're going, uh, maybe she's thinking about it. It just kind of happened, and, and now they're going, and now it's like, well. I think they're all mourning together. Right, because we think about these, you know, poor young women. I focused on Naomi, um, but these poor young women, I mean, they just lost their husbands. They're now also vulnerable. They're not strangers, but they're widows with no male children to protect them. So they're ex they're emotionally, I'm sure, distraught. They're, um, you know, they have no one to provide for them. They're totally vulnerable. Which is why, interesting, again, you might have thought, go back to your father's house, because your father is the male provider. But your mother's house, where you can find another male provider and a spouse for you. So maybe, you know, as this journey slowly taking underway, this thought of Naomi thinking, because, yes, they're in mourning. So how clearly are any of them thinking at that moment? They're sort of just acting on automatic, heard there was food, um, and Naomi wants to go home. I mean, luckily for her, there's food. Really, you know, it's time to go. I have a question. Yes. In that verse in the Hebrew, in between the word ima and the word 
Yaas, there is an unqualified word in verse 8. Verse 8. Truly have a late email. And then there's. Oh, okay. Unlocalized. Okay, so in, I'll tell you why. So if, you see, if people are looking in verse 8, yeah. there's a word with no vowels in it. So what that's showing us, that in the book of Ruth, when we read from a scroll that's been written by a scribe, the word appears, yaas, appears yaasa, with a hey, which is, <laughs> so, when, but when you read it, you're supposed to pronounce it yaas. So what does that mean? That means that because this happens rarely, but it also happens in the Torah also, is that sometimes word, scribal error creeps into the text. And so the right word should have been yaas, but somehow over time the word became yaase, but it was so long ago or we don't know. So we don't change the scroll because it's sort of, you know, that, that mistake is like, it's not just our scroll that's wrong. That scroll, it's a universal mistake. It can't be that word, it's not grammatically correct, we don't know how it got there, but we're not going to look at a scroll, let's say, of the Torah and go, well, we don't know how this word got here, but we know it's wrong, so we're not going to make a decree that everybody in the Torah, you know, should change their Torah, but we're going to make an indication in the printed text that this is really the right word. So you do see that on occasion. Luckily, only on occasion, it's actually pretty amazing if you think about, you know, scribal, like playing telephone, but scribal error. Um, how easy it would be for that to creep in and how careful the scribes have to be to make sure that it doesn't. But at some point, certain, certain things did, and then they were like, became, they were, it was so early in our history that it was a universal scribal error. So, um, okay, so, may the Lord grant that each of you find security in the house of a husband. So if you had any question about what Naomi's intention was by sending the girls back, now it's very clear that she's sending them back in order so that they can find a new husband. And she kissed them farewell and they broke into weeping and said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. And that word shuv is, is you know, threading its way through the verses, you know, being repeated about returning, right? Coming and going and returning and where should we go? And it's so beautiful, right? You know, for them to say, no, we're going to go to the land of your people. And this is the moment, and we're going to see it doesn't hold true for Orpah, but it certainly does for Ruth, of the question of how can they marry a Moabite woman? They have no idea when this story begins. We assume the boys have no idea that these women are going to ever, either of them are ever going to identify with the Israelite people. And yet we're going to see, of course, that's the greatness of the story of Ruth. But Naomi replied, turn back my daughter, again, shuv, turn back my daughter, why should you go with me? Have I any more sons in my body who might be husbands for you? So let's start with my girls, it's sad, right? It's sad, right? I, mean, I she's older, but you have sons that have been married, you know, for 10 years at this point, like she's not going to have any more children. Why does she say that? Why, why is that the issue? If you had an elaborate marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So good, elaborate marriage. So case, for those who don't know, what is what is elaborate marriage? So in the Torah, we're told that when a man dies, when a man dies to a woman, he's married, and he, they die, he dies, and she's childless. That the brother has to marry her. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would want to marry your brother-in-laws, but that's <laughs> but the idea is again a woman, and if you do, we probably shouldn't talk about that either. Um, <laughs> so when a woman is left as a widow without any children, she's extremely vulnerable. So he has a financial responsibility to marry her and bring her into his household and to give her a child in his brother's name. Now here's where it gets tricky, we need to remember this for later on in the story. That child inherits all of his father's assets. So, it is a financial responsibility on the part of the brother with all of the responsibility 
and no financial benefits. Because he doesn't get to keep his brother's property. He's got to care for the, the, this woman and provide for her. He's got to provide for the child, I mean, you know, maybe things above and beyond the assets, and he never gets the assets. I mean, you may have control over them for a while um, when the child is younger, if it's, you know, land or if it's, you know, livestock, but ultimately he doesn't get any of that. So it's considered this amazing, loyal, loving act to do for your brother, but it's not something that is, you know, which you'd say, well, he should do it anyways, even though there's no benefit to it, but there might actually be, you know, financial even loss to it. So, there is a ritual for getting out of it, right? You can get out of it, you can refuse to do it. Um, not seen as a very nice thing, and so there's this ritual that's described where you take off the shoe and then it gets spit on. So you can get out of it, but it's a very humiliating ritual, right? It's a very humiliating ritual because that's kind of the point. If you're not willing to do this, you're a jerk. Um, you know, if we're going to treat you like a jerk, and then you're free to go on your jerky little way. Um, so again, you have to keep that in mind because this is going to play out later on. Later on in the story about why this is why this is significant. So what Naomi is saying is, is I'm never going to have any more sons to do this Leverite marriage with you. Like that would be the responsibility. If I had another son, um, they would have to marry one of you or both of you. Um, but I don't. So I, I what could I what could I possibly help you with? So what does Naomi think that she has nothing, right? She has nothing for these girls. Nothing. I have no sons. It's like nothing to offer you. So you should go back to your parents. And they'll find somebody for you, hopefully. And it's a really sad statement of Naomi at this moment of how she really, how she's really feeling. She has nothing. Nothing. In, yes. But how compassionate. Yes. Yes. She's incredibly compassionate, but she's worrying about them at this time. At that moment, she's worried about them and their futures, which is beautiful and loving. But and you will see when you know what she says to her townspeople. She had better for herself. Nothing. That's a mother. Mm -hmm. That's a mother. Right. That's a mother who's lost her only children. I mean, what you know? She has nothing, but she does have compassion for these and love for these girls, and she voices that appreciation for them, which I think is so beautiful and so touching. Even if I thought there was hope for me. She doesn't, right? The corollary to even if I thought there was hope for me is there is no hope for me. But even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I were married tonight and I also bore sons, should you wait for them to grow up? I mean, these women are no, you know, married for 10 years, no children, you're not going to wait. I mean, even if you'd say people get married young, there's a biological clock, right? The biological clock is, is ticking and there's no, you know. Um, should you wait for them to grow up? Should you, on their account, debar yourselves from marriage? I mean, you'd have to wait. Even if I got married tonight, which isn't going to happen, even if I got pregnant right away, even if I bore sons, what were we talking, 15, 12, 13, 14, 15 years? You'd be alone all those years? Oh, no, my daughters. And that's beautiful what she calls them, right? When we're talking about a story about what names mean and having names and mentioning names and the woman and those two, than my daughters. Let me see for a minute. Hmm? Beautiful. That's what I was looking for. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I should make a note of that, but that's not to teach that. That's beautiful, right? The name change, and name changing is very significant in the Torah and what we call people, and name changing. And it's usually God changing names now, but to go from my daughter in laws to my daughters. Again, like when I, I take a lot of inspiration from the people that I know in the congregation, and one of the things that I sometimes hear, and something I think about again as I'm about to become a mother in law, people will say to me, You know, my in laws made no distinction between their children and their in laws. Right? We were all their children. Sometimes I hear a different story. I don't always hear that. Um, and I thought a lot about, like, how do you make that transition? Like, how, I, I 
I'm thrilled with the with the woman that my son is marrying, and I, and I, I care for her. I've known her for four years, but you know, how do I begin to think of her as no different than him? Is an interesting and very challenging transition. But I hear I hear testimony of people that have done it really quite successfully, but that transition, right, from my daughter-in-laws to my daughters, is so powerful and so beautiful. And I'm glad to hear that it's reflected in the Hebrew um, and not just in the English. My, my lot is far more bitter than yours, for the hand of the Lord has struck out against me. I mean, she's loving, but understandably hurt. hurt. And her lot, her lot is bitter. Her lot is horrifically bitter. And we're going to end here. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, it's 11.27. We're supposed to end at 11. This is good, right? This is good. Things are bad. But next week, things will be better. And I should probably make a note to myself where we ended so I remember.